and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Spellbook Publishing, and the man who, app who apparently wants to try and outbeard ZZ Top. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> or out or outbeard Gandalf. Also good luck with that. Gandalf is the target, yeah. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it pays off for him. <laughs> He is he is not the he is not the Jace, he is not a Jace, he is just Jace. Jace. Just Jace. Yes, good day. Well met, my friend. <laughs> uh, glad, glad to be in the temple. I will definitely make sure to take advantage of that open bar of yours. Mm-hmm. And oh. uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yep. Just make sure to keep away from my stash in the back. Um last time somebody dipped into that, we they um had they had to they had to take a real they had to take a really cold bath to get to wake them up. Oh, that that's the top shelf stuff back there, the home brews. Yeah, that's the that's the hope that's the home brews that that I that I make for my I make for myself. It's a case of um, angels fear to angels fear to tread that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the best of the third party. That's that's awesome. Hmm. Ah, uh, and. Include, including that, including one special call that um we <laughs> that I inherited called that nicknamed Galaxy because you, because you're gonna be seeing stars after after you have it. <laughs> um, along I'm, sure with some, that, I'm sure that one goes down very smooth. <laughs> well, it, go, it goes down it goes down smooth, but you're but you're 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 either you're either gonna be you're either gonna be high in. The, you're ahead in the clouds, or you're going to be out. <laughs> fair, fair enough. I, I'll, I'll steer clear. I mm -hmm. stick to the iced tea these days. So. <laughs> um. Next time, I, next time I head up into Canada, if I if I ever can, I want to try caboose. Oh, you're going to beat me on a Canadian reference? Oh no! <laughs> I knew it was going to start early. What's a caboose? Um, that's a, it's a line, it's a line of be it's a, um, line of beers that's, you, that's, um, head, that's kind of a local thing in BC. Okay, yeah, no. I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm one province over. <laughs> Time um, limited in there, but yeah, no, see, I knew you were going to beat me on references, but a Canadian one, you just had to throw salt on it, sorry. Uh, if I wanted to throw salt on the wound, I would have made a, I would have made a letter Kenny reference. Oh yes, you're, that's well. That's the one skip up across the pond for you. No, you're Minnesota, so uh, Letter Kenny is something I, I try to catch, but um, I only get the highlights of. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh, first introduction. Okay, uh, my first introduction uh, for role-playing games was way back in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Ed Rules and Encyclopedia. And two buddies of mine, I don't know if I should name drop, uh, uh, Sean Tracy and Stuart Pallard, they were uh, three years older than me, and um, it was like babysitting night or whatever, and they walked me through making a character for like two hours, and I got so involved in it, and I was going to be the world's best wizard just right right off the bat, and they proceeded to spend the next hour uh, playing because I died within the first 15 minutes. But that, that got me hooked, and I was uh, um, a few, few gaps in time just because of groups and timing and schools and such like that, but I've been playing role-playing games and tabletop games ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly 40k, I'll be honest. Um, I am uh, I was a hard K 40k'er before for a um, couple years ago with the, I don't, I'm not going to say it, but a couple years ago where we weren't allowed to see each other and um, that, that slowed me down a bit, but then uh, I went back to D&D and we played online and haven't turned back ever since. Twice a week, it's been great. It's kind of got me through the 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 downtime of the 40k because I loved 40k. 
Yeah, I um, I've I've been keeping an eye on on some on some things with forty with forty k and with Warhammer and um. The 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 Warham the Warhammer Plus thing re um really left a sour note for a lot of people. Oh well, yes it did. Um, especially 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 when it meant no more um, no more TTS. Yeah, which was a big one for their downtime. Which timing wise, like that was going to be a very popular thing for people at the time, and they kind of swept the rug out, but. Uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, to each their own of the companies. I get monetary plans with companies and stuff like that. I'm just not about that right now. And, yeah. yeah. And of course, of course, uh, of course, I of course I have a bit of an old grudge when it comes to the end times, but that's a, that's fantasy, not 40k. Um, when you when you were dipping into 40k, was it mostly through, was it mostly through the war game, or was it through any of the um, RPGs? So I did have a round with the RPG, um, and, and we kind of looked at the Death Watch books. Um, but uh, mine was the Inquisitor, uh, which was a very fun game, and uh, it was kind of based when the Dan Abnett mo uh, novels came out uh, with the Eisenhorn stuff. So it was mm -hmm. it was just a fun game to be, and uh, kind of dip me back in one more time back into the RPG world. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, uh, uh, but I no, I was a, a even a tournament player with 40k. So in our where I'm from, up in Alberta, there's a, a very good scene both uh, up in Edmonton and Calgary for. So we had a lot of tournaments relatively uh, compared to most areas, and uh, that was a good group. Now some t took it more competitively than uh, I'm an orc player, so we, I'm, I'm there to have fun, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, it was just great get together. So um, that's where I, I also kind of uh, stuck to it in the lore sense and reading the horse heresy novels. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on like book 34 of those, and uh, that's just been a whole world to dip into. Lots of influence. Like Dan Abnett's one of the gods of writing, in my opinion. So um, watching him weave that web with the horse heresy has been a great influence on. Uh, how to build an empire, a galactic empire in the Neptiverse kind of thing. What do you think of Aaron Dembski Bowden as a writer? I know he's kind of divisive. It, it, there's gro there's been growth. So that's what I like to see in writers when they're early and then they kind of absorb other people's kind of uh, some, tr not some tropes or anything, right? But I, I saw growth uh, in him. So um, I, again, he's not on my list. I wouldn't put him up there, but uh, yeah. I think yeah. I think Dems I think when it comes to his forty k work, Dembski is perfectly fine, so long as you don't have him write anything imperial. Yes. Okay. So, and that's the the tough part because the imperial there's very strict lore guidelines to write with him. Um, they unless you're creating your own like uh, and have that kind of license given by the Black Library, it's like there's certain source material you have to stick to and have to know. So if you're writing a whole novel about it and you steer clear or you miss something, uh, the fans, the, uh, the stalwarts, they'll, they'll point it out. And um, so a lot of uh, novelists in the 40K uh, genre have uh, fallen victim to that, unless they've been around the lore since the very beginning. I'd say the big whipping boy in that, rega in that regard is Dan Ward. Uh, Matt Ward, dude. Yeah, Matt Ward. I'm not. Why did I say yeah. Dan Ward? No worries. Yeah, that, Matt Matt's, Ward. <laughs> Matt Spiritual Liege w Ward, the I guy know. who some fans call the Fifth Chaos God. Yes, there well, because he kind of took Fifth Edition. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things that switched when. Uh... And well, yeah, that's why I kind of uh, stuck hard on the 30k. It, it kept it grounded where 40k kind of went. What in a lot of senses I was mm -hmm. you get um, lost the um, I, you got to focus on that immersion when telling a story and uh, if you don't have everyone grounded on a certain uh, a, a steady sturdy plateau like that's uh, tough for some writers yeah. he was definitely victim to like my hero is the best hero <laughs> and that doesn't work for what it's worth the t the times that I had 
that I have um, played the war game proper, the army that I had used was um, a mix of Salamanders and Imperial Guard. Um, large, largely because my, my, my whole one aspect of my approach, because so many people were doing um, were doing were doing Smurfs or or some of the other bigger uh, Marine chapters and bringing in a whole lot of armor, I would. I would do. I would do. I would do ambush. <laughs> I would have an ambush tank manu- tank tanking maneuvers. So, yeah, you know, and you so you and using um stuff like ter- stuff like terminus pattern land raiders. Oh, in case you're <laughs> like uh, kind of the pincer maneuver. Yeah. Flan- flanking. Okay. And. There were a, there were a few times where I abused the I abused a one of the more infamous oversights in the form of Creed. Uh, the character Creed. Yeah, Usakar E. Yeah. Creed, the guy who, the guy who became a meme because of the tactical genius rule that <laughs> has it that any unit he's attached with is treated as a scout unit, meaning that meaning that because of that you could technically treat. Um, Warhound Titans as scouts. <laughs> yeah. See, uh, there's the guy thinking. I I was an orc, so mm-hmm. I I knew of, there was rules being broken all the time. I just stuck to the mods. Mine was basically I paint them uh, in the themes, like the bad moons. Mm-hmm. I'd have an army for the Goths, which is your soldiers, and then uh, the red side, like the evil sons, was all the red fast. Uh, bikes and and little buggies and death mm-hmm. copters. Um, again, all, it was sheer rule of cool. But the rules with some of the heroes they got on there, um, I'll, I'll be honest, I fell victim to one. There was one war boss that was on a bike that was uh, he could he had like uh, that big fist that normally no matter who's wearing it, whatever art you, you strike last, no matter what, mm-hmm. but not him. He struck first, and it was just, um, it, it, yeah. It's not, to, it's not to go out and abuse that, but it, it's if it's part of the rules, and that's what they call balance, and may hate to sell models. But that that actual uh, rule set was around for quite some time yeah. before I dabbled in it. So, but get getting back to the getting back on the rails for a moment. Um, I can steer you clear of the rails, but no, yes, <laughs> rails, rails, uh, rails. Walk me, th- walk me through the chain of events that led to the cre- the creation of the Neptiverse setting. I, I know that I know that on the site and otherwise you've um st- you stated Treasure Planet as one of the inspirations. Um, I'm curious what I'm curious what else inspired it and how the idea to make this setting came to be. Okay, so um, in all honesty, um, Treasure Planet was one of the Disney movies I had missed as a kid, and it wasn't an inspiration until, I, like, I had written lots and I had uh, a, um, the architect stuff like that, so all already pre-written, the kind of galaxy hopping, uh, more of the Stargate amp, but that was all written, but then someone suggested uh, in my playtest group, you should watch Treasure Planet. It gives me that real vibe that uh, that's the world I'm playing in, and so then I watched it and I was like, "Oh my god, this is this is it!" Like this was what I was picturing, and they did such a good job, Disney even for way back then. But um, that was part of the inspiration of the, the kind of like it's, uh, it's not steampunk. It, I call it Arcana punk, mm-hmm. um, but very epic fantasy. Uh, there is a uh, an, an empire kind of thing, and then there's the rebel aspect of it, and the the kind of the gray areas in between, and um, giving it uh, uh, and also a flavor of uh, and I brought it up because they kind of uh, uh, released it again while I was already writing the stuff was Arcane from League mm-hmm. of Legends and Netflix. Yep. Yep, and that hit home very much in the politics aspect of the campaign I was writing. So when my players were going through this, they're like, "Oh, they, they, we all watched it together," and it was like, "Oh, this hits home with Cornerstone. Like this is exactly there's two levels. There's the outsiders and the the duels and the 
Um, it, I call it mainland, southland, northland. There's divisions of classes and there's tension between them all. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the politics of the On the Brink campaign book. That uh, is part of the Kickstarter. So I have the, uh, the player's handbook, the DM guide with all the rules, and, and then uh, the campaign book, which is that kind of political tension that we're talking about there. Yeah. But those were the two two main influences, the new ones. While writing it, it was very much Star Wars, kind of galactic empire politics influenced. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, you mentioned that you considered Neptiverse to be arcana punk. Um, what did you mean, what did you mean by that? So, uh, it starts off with, there's kind of like a steampunk feel to it, but instead of the engineering with the cogs and the, I do a, a gem, an imbued gem, uh, I call it arc tech. Mm -hmm. So, uh, different types of rifles have different types of shines, but different types of gems mean different schools of magics imbued within those firearms or... Uh, it, again, uh, some arrow boards, which are like your f uh, floating ho hoverboards, kind of you see in Arcane or Treasure Planet. Um, but everything's based off arc tech, which is kind of the replacement for the technology in this uh, sci fantasy world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, all the magic items are all custom made. Um, about half of them are the architect stuff, and the other half is just uh, universe, the Neptiverse kind of stuff, just to give flavor and uh, addition to what's available in the spell genre. Yeah, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Architect is the is um, a kind is a kind of is a kind of Magitech like like approach, more than anything else. Uh, yeah, magical technology. Um, mm -hmm. Because of how, uh, not again, we, we wrote this a long time ago, but uh, in one D&D, &D, they're actually splitting up the magics. There's going to be the arcane, the divine, and then the uh, primal. And we've, in the Neptiverse, we've been playtesting that for like two years. We have divine magic, we have our arcane magic. And they're already divided. The spells have been divided. The classification is divided. So um, that's already built in into the Dungeon Master Guide. Uh, oh, so they already, so yeah. they learned to, so they learned that they shouldn't have tried to fix what wasn't broken. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, and it just gives it a more of a flavor. Like when you're trying to be an artificer, uh, you can use that kind of science behind the spell instead of the oh, uh, it just happens because it's a miracle. Like. There's the difference, and it's heavily explained through um, the different school. Like if you're church going and paladin cleric uh, style, you you would see more of the divine magics growing up through the churches uh, or the the church, which is kind of a, a parallel power play as in the empire uh, in the Neptiverse. So, um, and then the architect, which is the magistrate, which is another pillar of the power of the empire. Mm -hmm. And and so the differences between the two are, are played heavily. And um, then there's also, in that primal, we call it, uh, there's also void magic, which you'll get some of the cancellation magic, so the dispels or the uh, stuff that you're taking away stuff or rising from the the other, the nether realm, like the, the lesser planes and such. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's why... Uh, our magic is it's, it's already separated. We're kind of one step ahead, ready for one D and D because we've been already play testing that for a couple of years now. Yeah. Uh, and I'd also saw I'd also saw that one of the magics that you have is well the the five that you have, if I'm reading this right, are weave, divine magic, void magic, rune magic, and arcanum. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the weave is kind of the fabric of everything. So it's sitting there at the top mm -hmm. as part of like, this is the, the physics of existence uh, and non-existence. It's everything. Uh, and then it gets divided down into those four. Uh, the reason I have the rune and the arcanum different is uh, uh, dwarves and the giant, well, it starts off with the, it's the old giant language and their magic, even though it's very science, it's a, it's kind of a lost technology that's 
just being discovered in the Empire as we explore planets. It's one of those like lost civilizations we're exploring where the dwarves are very good at that and they mine and they dig deep to try and find any traces of the rune magic. Whereas Arcanum, it's the foundation of the Empire already. It's what gets us from point A to point B. It's what uh, powers our cities. It's um, it's it's already uh, a well pronounced within the Empire. The divine magic is again pillar of the church. Your clerics, your healing. Uh, there's many divine orders representing the nine gods. Uh, one of them, I'll just point. It's like the order of the crescent moon which is a uh, uh, goddess Asia, who's mm-hmm. a lunar god. And uh, yeah, so those are kind of divided up into night, nightly orders. And then the void magic, again, it's, it's kind of a forbidden magic within the, uh, the empire. It's not to be toyed with, but uh, those in power do know of its existence and it's highly protected secret. And yes, there's some rebels that dabble or some with ill intent that have learned or have found stuff that uh, use the void magic. But basically, it's a, it's a highly banned uh, form of magic, and the way I work it into the, the actual writing of the lore, it's, it's where you get those higher level cancellations where you can dispel higher level magics or um, counter spell higher level magics. Mm-hmm. And other darker purposes. But. Yeah. <laughs> now, when it, whenever I... Th- when it comes to, I do want to. I'd like to focus a bit more on um, runes because the given given my given my background, the co- the concept of runes is so, is something I'm ve- I'm very much in, I'm very much interested in. And me too. What I'm a, a lot of times when rune magic is is utilized in fantasy settings, the idea is that it, while it isn't as it doesn't have the the same amount of raw power as 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 a lot as the more traditional forms of magic, it is far more stable. So uh, I have it a little bit kind of reversed on that, um, known as the kind of the ancient sigils. Uh, they're what embodied like the fundamental magic of the weaves creation. So, the building blocks of physics were into runes, like uh, a programming language. Very much so. Yes, as a programmer, myself. there you go. So it is what is in behind uh, when you uh, um, have something set up uh, in in uh, say a temple or. Um, a whole city even, I could say, that's been an ancient city. A lot of the time, its protections or its fabrication was made with old rune tech or rune sigils. Um, it is kind of forgotten in the Nectiverse, or uh, much of its knowledge lost. Kind of like uh, humans right now, we don't know about the pyramids or what the, that kind of a flavor to it, but the dwarves are uh, the, a, a corpo guild. Lots of them are miners and, and are looking for that rune tech. Um, it is again uh, uh, in how the lore works. One of the old ranges, like the ancients, the giants, they were the ones that first had that and then shared it with the dwarves and others, but lost over time. But um, it's also like very jealously guarded by the dwarves. They don't like to share it. They're not going to go teach what they know, even though it's limited, like relatively limited to what's available or what's in there. They. Uh, they're not going to go out and just give it away. Mm-hmm. But yeah, definitely the building blocks. Programming codes, uh, an app description. Mm-hmm. And I'm ge- I I would guess in that regard, Arcan- Arcanum is what is um what would be con- what would be considered ma- what would be considered magic by a lot by a lot of people in the fo- in terms of arcane magic. Yes, fair. That's. I just use the other term for it, kind of the same flavor we're going with the magistrate, the the capacitorum, where it's more of a a very Latin influenced as part of the silver host, the gods' names, their old old Latin. Um, let's say mixes. Not all of them are, are just Latin words, but they, there's a lot of translation from Latin in the magistrate and the empire. Hmm. Now, 
when it comes to the empire, you mentioned the you mentioned a political structure of it. Is it is it a sent? I keep get, with a lot of with some of the art representation of them. I keep getting a a very a very Roman vibe. And what with that in mind, would the empire be more, would the empire in this case be more akin to the Roman Empire or the Roman Republic? Oh. Uh. Hmm. I would say Roman Empire. Ah, okay, so the Republic, because no, correct me if I'm well, wrong, because like, I think I'm I guess, getting there. There is a Senate. There isn't I guess, a Caesar. Yeah, I guess the better way for me to put it is: Would you consider it a constitutional monarchy? No monarchs. There are every every uh, planet gets a senator into the Kappa Senatorum, but of mm -hmm. course some planets have more powerful senators than others. Well, others are more pawns in the game played by the powerful. Um, so I would more of the oh, I hate this reference with I'll say Game of Thrones, uh, but without the king, it's that council sits everyone and they have to work together or work apart to gain well, more power. Since since you're going into science fantasy, maybe we can use Dune as the reference instead. Which sorry, you cut off for a second. Which one? Um, since you're going with science fantasy, maybe we can use Dune as the reference instead. Very good. Okay, yes, Dune is a great reference from this, where there are uh, planetary motivations uh, mm -hmm. within an empire. Yeah. And I'm guess I'm guessing that because of that, there are several houses that have their, that have their own authority. Correct. Even within the capital, it's more of like um, it's like a uh, you know how the Vatican works, where it's isolated in that sense. It's mm -hmm. uh, people can all go there, convene. Uh, it is where the ambassadors speak. It's kind of the capital of the empire. It's where uh, again a huge just a yeah, political viper pit is the best mm -hmm. way to put it. There's a lot of power hungry motivations, and um, but it, with with such large, like if you look where I'm on 106 planets, I've started writing about, but that's just on the map. So later we can discover more, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on that, there's a lot of senators. So there's a lot of threats to the empire's longevity just from within, because that's a lot of planetary, their own motivations. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the history, there's a few civil wars and expansionist wars that nearly destroyed itself on numerous occasions. So. Um, that's that kind of history is written within. So when the players are working out the campaign and learning that those stories, they'll see like, oh, that's why this house hates this house, and that's why even a thousand years ago they were button heads, kind of thing. Like those kind of things are wo wo uh, woven into the lore. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking into the, when I was looking into the material for the for the empire, I also saw the. The first off, there's the fact that the that um the player characters are are assumed to be members of the Ordo Vivandi Vanadi, um, and would it be fair of me to say that the Ordo is not far removed from the Praetorian Guard? You're on point, I must say. Okay, so yeah, but mixed with uh, the Unreal with the um. Guardians of the Galaxy and Men in, or FBI and Men in Black, mm -hmm. the specialists, right? But yes, yeah. uh, the elite of the elite that are in charge of not only the Kappa Senatorum's will, but the charge of the Empire. If the Kappa Senatorum gets all a little bit too uh, like too many poison apples in there, um, that's where uh, some of that gets rooted out. Would be in charge of the Ordo Venandi. Um, there's a little bit. I'll be honest, uh, Inquisitor. From 40k, uh, Dan Abbott, another that is a heavy flavor on that uh, as well. I was going to so, say a bit. I was going to say a bit of a bit of the emperor, a bit of the emperor's most holy inquisition, and yes, a bit and a bit of the assassin orders. Yeah, very very much so. Because well, there's the a wide variety. Because you can as part of the Ordo, there's a wide variety if you're the more book study or the more religion, there's different divisions mm -hmm. and uh, different uh, this is kind of a sneak peek release but 
uh, the campaign, the, the first one, only deals with the Hereticus, but we've written, to, or starting to play two more. So, um, the, it's different divisions. One is more holy, how are, and then the other one's attacking all monsters, the galaxy's monsters. Mm -hmm. so, so, but this one is all the Hereticus, so you're dealing with the corruption within the, the government and the corpo guilds and the church and the power players of the Empire. And when you mentioned... When when you mentioned the Inquisition, what something that came to mind is the is the interesting way that the in, that um inquis that inquisitors check each other, in the sense that <laughs> an individual inquisitor, the amount the amount of the amount of political and military power has no up has on paper no upper limit. Now, you note that I said on paper. Yep. Because, you because an an inquisitor exercising their authority might fuck up the plans of another inquisitor who's ex who's exercising their authority, and in that kind of situation, one of them is probably going to get accidented by a by a vindicare or have or have a very unfortunate evening with an eversore. Yeah, if he can't get along, then he's got to get removed and. Some of those Inquisitor Lords have more power than others. It's more of the plays behind you. But, but uh, you're very right. Conflicts have happened. And uh, within the Ordo, they try and have it discussed out. But uh, when there is personal motivations and no one's... Uh, not everyone's immune to those kind of things, then, mm -hmm. yeah, there uh, you can abuse power. Uh, uh, you've passed the insight check here, or you definitely you've passed your history check. I've, uh, within the um, early openings of one of the campaigns or the adventures, is it's all about that and finding out that holy, I got to be careful because I can't even trust my own organization. So uh, very uh, astute of you to. Uh, it's not like so much a trope; it just adds to the mechanics of that advantage, adventure where you got. You're on your own, kind of thing. You don't have anyone to trust at this point. Um, you can. Sh I disagree with the whole. You don't have anyone to trust. You can trust them completely to shoot you in the back. <laughs> as as Gar as Garrick once said, it is the safest way. Yeah, that's uh, that's one thing you can trust. It is the betrayal, but uh, yeah. technically, if you always have to. You gotta have some people on your corner, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and even if it's you trust them to do what they're gonna do. That's that's, that's some form of ally, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can at least plan <laughs> ahead. <laughs> now, one thing. One thing that I. One thing that I'm cu that I'm curious about is. So it, in the Ludio Codex, you're, you're talking about putting a bunch of new race, races and subclasses, um, as well as well as a bunch of new backgrounds. I'd like to, I'd like to go, in, I'd like to go into the subclasses. Now, I'm not going to ask you to, to name off all of the sub all of these subclasses that you ha that you have planned, obviously. But what would be if for Given my given my um, given my name, I can, I kind of have to ask this: Are there any subclasses for the monk? Yes, we do have one for the. Uh, actually, I think two are, are the second is be, being uh, re finished right now. So we have two subclasses for the monk. Um, we have one that is based of uh, basically a shock kind of trooper. Mm -hmm. And uh, always up at the front of the battle, more of a a chance of being a beefier monk, um, and more of a like a Steven Seagal or a Jean Claude Van Damme kind of style martial artist was the flavor we were getting from that. But yeah, uh, that that one uh, it came with uh, a, a few special moves that mm -hmm. uh, would be handy for boarding actions or uh, very. Uh, Surprise kind of combat after like dropping a smoke grenade, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's w one of the monks. Uh, other ones, okay, like uh, the, all the subclasses were to develop the flavor of the Neptiverse, so uh, that's where kind of like the distinction comes from the regular D&D. Is uh, all in our subclasses, you're now 
have technology or arc tech or ineptiverse flavor. Mm -hmm. And um, like the, the rogue, okay? So the rogue, we have one rogue called the shover. And the shover uh, is basically like a skateboarder. It starts out like a, just a young hoodlum, but uh, he's very adept at uh, aerial tricks and starts getting to the air, aero board phase where they can ride like a, a surf sail or an aero, like those magical hoverboards that can sail and, and basically have the imbued fly spell within. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the way we explain that one is like there's different types of maneuvers you can do on an aero board and the shover is proficient at these maneuvers and st uh, reducing opportunity to different types of, uh, again, subclasses like that, but they're all, all uh, based on the flavor and the technology of the Neptiverse. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's where we definitely have a, a huge distinction. It's not to say you can't have other worlds that uh, you can use other uh, uh, subclasses of ours, but there is a, a definite distinction in our subclasses compared to the uh, normal D and D or the other first party D and D uh, mm -hmm. subclasses out there. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the or, when it comes to the ordos, how would they be represented with it within character creation? Would that be um, in in different backgrounds? Or are, there, or are there some subclasses that are tied to the Ordos? So uh, it, it, there are the investigative kind of subclasses we have in the Rogue, but that also is um, adaptable for what's uh, out there already. Um, but not so much specific to the Ordo in the subclasses, more specific to the universe. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely in backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, it, what we've done, again, following 1D&D, &D is kind of the backgrounds gives you feats, and we've got a graded feat system going. And uh, some of our feats, uh, like one of them is a, a feat that uh, y you're very apt at knowing faces. And when you see people, uh, uh, you can remember that face uh, uh, with proficiency on that history check. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can build, you know that... Uh, the famous meme where there's a uh, from <laughs> always studying Philadelphia. He's got a web of people and he's putting it together kind of yeah. seriously. Like that's that that's a, a feat that you you can see webs and connections where there's not always a uh, an obvious connection. Mm -hmm. You're very good at uh, deducting conspiracies. Uh, yeah, but yeah, the divisios themselves they're like one's the Estrada, which is uh, a kind of the the, the star travelers, the um, the law out and about in the in the in the uh, Neptiverse, like this in between space. There's the Monstrum, which is dealing with all the monsters. Uh, the Magikai is rogue magic users and, and dealing with the sanctioned magic, making sure no one's producing uh, illegal magic. Uh, the Diabolus and the Abyssus, they uh, they take care of the uh, kind of the nine the Nihilvet and the, mm -hmm. all the dark planes. And then the hereticus is your, uh, they are your authority on root of corruption. Uh, they subdue ambition and they kind of silence the, the dissent of the people. That's their ministers of propaganda, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, within there, there's leadership. They kind of uh, jokingly refer to as the brass. But uh, yeah, that's the, the Divio specs. They, they're more in the, the feats are, are very handy to become... Uh, different types of agents. Some of those mm -hmm. feats we have, yeah, distinctive. And but as an as an aside, I have been looking. I've been keeping a a eye on the on the updates when it comes to one D and D, and I have been laughing because it's <laughs> it it's a whole lot of putting things in that should that should have been in from day one. Uh, well, I, I gotta give them some credit. They are doing a listening to that uh, a lot of that fan submitted survey, and they have a few ambassadors out there. Uh, shout out to Nerd Emergent. He he's really promoting people to get the word in to how, how really it. As a playtester myself for many years, um, it really helps to have other people's opinion when having the perspective going in, because uh, you can only there's only so much time in a day and. Uh, a lot of us playtesters, that's like a, a luxury to be able to get that much gaming in. So uh, having other people's opinion and the opinion of the community for what to look for 
mm -hmm. is uh, very, very handy. So I do have to give them credit that they are listy. But yes, just like spelled, there has been some lazier productions and mistakes made where there should be more oversight. So I yeah. do admit that, but at the same time, uh, I got to give them credit. They are listening, and that's the best a community can do. They're not. They're also the power creep isn't so strong with uh, Wizards yet, of the Coast yet. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. I... <laughs> I am always I'm always keeping an eye out for the for when the other shoe will drop. Well, Tasha's was peeking that toe over. I'll tell you that. And ever since then, I've been like, "Oof, there's some spells out there that are very who who's the playtester on this?" But um, Cal's they, it's it's not so bad compared to some of the ga other gaming companies I, I've uh, or I dabble with. Um. Though I'm still going to be picking on them for Calzilla still being a thing. But I, but I pick up, I pick on everybody because I believe in equality. Yes, there's not. You don't. <laughs> you don't assert. Yeah, I pick on everyone. Mm hmm. I, mean, I may be an ass, but I'm an equal opportunity one. Very much so. Well, that's the best that can be asked of you, and yeah. it's the most respectable. So. Now, given that the empire. Comp Composes multiple pla multiple planets within its territory. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious how um, interplanetary travel w works. Is it a case oh. of going between gates, or is it a case of moving um, faster than light? How 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 would it end up working? Okay, so the known realm right now it's called the Silver Host Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way we have it graphed, it spans basically trillions of light years, and there's different connected. Uh, uh, connections through a set of arcane gates. Uh, these gates, unfortunately, were made in an unknown time by an unknown people, even past the rune tech. Uh, and these gates, they call them the Lastra Porta, and it's basically what the Silver Host was founded upon. Um, it, my main art right off the bat, uh, on the inside of the cover, will be the uh, many planets and the tunnels and the mm -hmm. uh, astrology of this, but they, there's the main planet in the middle, it's within the core planet union, and then there's the outer planets, but everything's in different circles and web connectivity through these gates. Uh, part of the Empire is it's ever expansionist, looking for more of these gates. So they fund through corpo guilds and the Kappa Senatorum alliances. Uh, when politics is right, they send out these exploratory guilds and try and find more planets with these gates and traces of... Yeah. And, and there's... Uh, again, one of the subclasses. We have a, a wizard that's basically discerning the paths of the gates. So it's an astral seer kind of thing, uh, um, astral path. Yeah. Hopefully they can. Hopefully they can still see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, they're not. Uh, we don't steal <laughs> that directly. But yes, no, they aren't uh, bred for this either. It's something that is taught, and it but, is arcane in nature. So yeah, but not I, genetic. I. I did note. I did note that you have six types of of planets. I'd like to. I'd like to go into. I'd like to go into those and what distinguishes one type of planet from another. Um, oh. Starting with starting with what a cat. What is what a capital planet is. All right. So yeah, you're going deep on me with this one. The planets. Uh, it, the six classes are based on sizes and gravities. Mm -hmm. um, some that are just the numbers like M three two one, M is your mediums, and then one two three is a class. And there's actually like the nine classes in there, um, but then yes, your capital planets and the core planets are the well established. They have a lot of uh, societies built within. If they have the gate, that city is ever expanding. It's kind of like the Toronto Greater Air. It just always keeps expanding. And then um, your outer planets are are less populated, mm -hmm. but uh, still have gates within them, and and uh, either are now being newly developed, where mining is going, or like the corpo guilds are taking over, and a lot of industries taking over, or there's some that are more rebellious and and fighting off the empires. Uh, greedy paws kind of thing, but uh, mm -hmm. within those classifications, it's different gravities and different sizings and then some have a different like a special mark if their sun is different like uh 
like if you need a different suit to be at this planet because of the sun's radiation or something like that. Or the or just the amount of heat, like like what goes like the reason why you Perfect. need a still suit when you're in a when you're in Arrakis, otherwise you're gonna shrivel up like a prune. Very much so. I, I we do have that kind of level of detail in our spy network for the Ordo. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a lot of military spy kind of technology within the 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 magic items, and that is one of them. It's the the rad suits, kind of Arctic rad suits, where you can go into the planar traveling and. Um, still be not affected by different radiations and different gravities. Mm-hmm. Wells and so um, with that in mind, what would a Navy planet consist of? So we do have, a, uh, so up near, it's Bakul. It is a, a completely ocean planet. And the, everything, all the corals are the structures of the people of Makul. Um, and... They kind of have a fish, elvish kind of mixed look, look to them. But uh, the McCool is uh, one with the nature of their planet. They're not out there polluting it. They've been a long, long-standing long emp- uh, part of the em- empire. Uh, they uh, don't really dabble with the politics. But the Navy planet there... Do you mean Navy is in the sense of like... Uh, Army, Navy, because I'm talking um, about the ocean. <laughs> Sorry, I'm ref- I'm referring to the Navy planet listing on th- on the map that you have uh, that you have. Okay, so that yes, that's like the port uh, strength of uh, uh, one of the more gate planets. Mm-hmm. So uh, th- that would be one that's a lot of traffic thoroughfare in between. Uh, mostly housing a, a, a navy there that can be transported within the system really quickly. Um, and if there are conflicts or invasion or something happening, those navy planets are where those get sent out to. So kind of like uh, the army bases around uh, certain key areas of the world. But sorry, mm-hmm. yes, I was talking about an ocean planet, the Makul. Yeah. And, and the Makul, that's an ocean planet to everybody's under, underwater. But my mistake on that. Yes, Na- Navy plan is more of the, uh, it's uh, uh, a garrison of all the ships and being able to spread out quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so what What about a forge planet? Is that, how I hear that and I immediately think of um, forge worlds. Is it is it on that kind of level where it's a planet that's have that, as a heavy manufacturing base? Depends on the industry the planet is best known for. But yes, there are uh, definitely machine, more machine kind of uh, planets where a lot of the hard fabrication, the more industrial uh, weapons of war, armor um, um, come from. But it's, some of the forge worlds are, are actually like the different, there's uh, uh, like um Fabrication, prefabbed worlds, they can make out, uh, make um, different types of housing that gets spread out near in that system. So it's, its influence kind of gets spread out within its neighbors. But uh, a forge definitely is something that is more of uh, industrious, uh, has the corporal guilds of the dwarves there mining, looking for gems. Uh, a heavy resource that is definitely needed within the Empire are imbuable gems. Because uh, gems are kind of like the magical batteries of the technology, and so yeah, those forge worlds there are heavily mined or heavily fabricating worlds. Mm-hmm. I'm so just gonna open up that same map that you have. Yes, yeah. that's the one wider. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to keep planets, um, I I immediately think of like like a um. Like so, like a like a castle t- like a castle town or some place that's on on the bo- on the border of a of a country's territory. Uh, yeah, more of a f- uh, fabrication, more um, defenses inlaid in the planet, just in case it is a, uh, a stronghold for just in case neighboring planets get like the smaller ones get uh, assaulted you can always go to a keep planet and be protected behind some form of fortification now mm-hmm. what that exactly is is there's a wide variety within the galaxy 
the Neptiverse, but uh, it, it can vary from uh, bio cannons to arc cannons to to even some that deal in some if they're really threatened and put into a corner. There's some void magic users out in mm-hmm. the d- different systems. So yeah, depending where you are, though. But yes. And- Port planets, I can, I can kind, I can kind of get what that, what they'd, what they'd be just from the name. But what about gate planets? Are they, are they mostly known for being a way station with the gate? Yeah. So every, pretty much every planet that's in the system, ninety-seven percent of them have uh, the arcane gate system, uh, especially the ones that are on the circles within mm-hmm. that map. They are definitely gate planets. But if they don't have any other function from the key planet, the port planet, the forager, the, all those, uh, then they just get the marking the gate. Whereas in a capital planet also has a gate, but it gets marked as a capital planet of the system where some of the local politics gets uh, delegated out to you or, um, yeah. So it, it, in, if it doesn't have any political significance or any fabrication or any empire significance, but still has a gate, that's the classification it gets. Mm-hmm. Now, you meant before we went live, we were talking about different forms of combat, and obvious, obviously, the boots on the ground kind of combat is what is well accounted for. But what about what about combat in in the air or or in space? Are you going Are you going to have rules to support that kind of thing? Yes, uh, that's one of the things I've felt. Um, recent, the, with the recent release, uh, Spelljammer, it was lacking. Um, there wasn't the ship-to-ship battle mechanics that would really uh, immersify you. So the good thing of what I had is in my playtesters, I had two Canadian Navy men in one party. So uh, I referenced them a lot. And I we made the it more of a, a master and commander feel, like the whole ship is one entity one uh, they it's all maneuvering together so uh we gave ships uh, maneuverability grades and with those grades come different like turning apparatus different firing rates different uh, damage areas like more complex advanced dungeon and dragons kind of uh mechanics for the the people that felt like oh it's just another combat with ship to ship battle in in the spell jammer we've kind of uh Made it. It's going to be a little bit longer, more intense, but at the same time, it'll give that feel like you turning capabilities or uh, dangerous maneuvers or uh, and different penalties for f- performing those maneuvers if if need be. So those mechanics are definitely in there. The other difference, major difference I've done is uh, atmospheric battle compared to uh, void battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, atmospheric, you're dealing with more. There's lots more to deal with. The, um, so we uh, also have a couple ships that, in atmospheric battle, they they're kind of like aircraft carriers, and they send out Griffin Riders or different. Uh, like within them, they they have an aviary within the, the ship, and that was a uh, um, kind of built into it. But in the void battle, it's more clear. There's different gravities of maneuvers that can be pulled. So it's a different set of mechanics. A lot relates, cross-relates, but different set of mechanics for both. It really kind of gave um, more of a unit. Like, you felt like a unit when in the ship with your party. There wasn't just individual actions. You guys were working together. Mm-hmm. Or the whole party was. Yeah. Guys, yeah. And... I'm curious. I'm curious. In, I'm curious in that. Are you? Would you be doing it where the ship, where the ship is controlled by the whole party, or have you have you given thought to um, people going out in indivi- in individual fight in individual fighters? If somebody wants to fulfill that particular fantasy, so uh, we, we it's kind of a, a unit working together. There is the control of the helm and such like that, but to facilitate some of those maneuvers. There's like the shifting. Uh, uh, one of our ships is more of a bi- uh, uh, like it's uh, kind of a cracking. And one of them, you, to do it shifting, you have to uh, poke the the uh, beast in certain areas to get it to shift. Like kind of like if you're trying to get a horse to canter, you use your outside rein and your inside leg. Or mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I'm probably getting that messed up. But those kind of mechanics. So 
it, it took a team to move it, but not the whole team. The other players were concentrating on the firing or the dispelling of people boarding or whatever was in there. It was more of a team. But if you wanted bonuses or facilitations, you, you worked as a team. But sure enough, yes, if things got dire, you can solo it up and, and everything like that. But there was more of the mechanics working as a unit. Mm-hmm. And, and we only play tested uh, about a year's worth mm-hmm. with with some of the ship stuff, but I really want to bring it home to some of the um, kind of the just making it everyday one shotters, like kind of like Guardians of the Galaxy, off to or like Star Trek. You're off to a planet for an episode. There you go, kind of thing. Um, so some of the I'll say just plug in stuff from the out on the brink. There's a few that are just plug in one offs that you go go sailing on a ship. Yeah. Um, given the, given that, have you given thoughts of putting in a planet generator? Ooh, I would love that. Um, yeah, no, that wouldn't be too difficult either. Especially what I have done is made uh, questionnaire like forms for people to throw in magical items they think of, and then we can play test it out, refine them. I uh, I do have a few helpers on the world building stuff. Um, but a planet generator would be amazing to uh, expand with, especially because I have on the art, I'm sure you have, there's a lot of those dots that need filling. So a generator would be cool. I have not, uh, not seen one or heard of one. Maybe developing one would be in the cards, but I'll be honest with the way, uh, I marketed this first Kickstarter and I just threw it out there. I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> like. I even made the Facebook post, hey, I've never told anyone this, but here you go, here's a case. I did this totally improperly, but on the second round, uh, talking to my friends in the community, a couple of the 3D CAD model builder, like uh, throwing those little extras in there would definitely uh, entice people to sign up. So mm-hmm. uh, a planet generator would be just fun to have as a kind of a side website part of the, on the website. Mm-hmm. What, no. do you know someone? No, <laughs> uh, and truth truth be told, if I were if I were to do that, it 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 would fe- it would feel like it wouldn't be you doing it. it. Would be there would be an asterisk on that matter. Yeah, no, that's uh, uh, that's the one thing I do want to mention is I do have a team of playtesters, mm-hmm. but uh, art I have one artist that uh, I commissioned for the majority of my other art, but. I'm doing this solo, so uh, it has been a learning experience, but um, ha- having a team on my weaknesses, like I'm not a very good marketer, or I don't like to be in the social media realm too much, or stuff like that, was, uh, I-, I realize I have weaknesses, so getting a team out there is something I, I-, I do plan on doing and have already started, so. Mm-hmm. And... What would you say have been some of the big takeaways you've had when it came, when you started doing um, play testing? I've been blessed to have two groups of consistent play testers. Uh, my Wednesday group, we don't miss Wednesdays. They are it's surprising. They everyone's there too. Uh, so I've been very blessed to have great play testers. My biggest takeaway is. There's so there's so much to uh, that goes behind a play test, especially in the D D world. It's not it's like a, a campaign story that continues. So there's not like a forty k play test where that game gets repeated, where I can just go works for Space Marines. Okay, play again, play again. That's not the how D D works. So the play testing with here is developing like classes and subclasses, races that we're play testing, having those characters play test. But at the same time, still telling a story to have them all show up every week that they're still enticed to play, um, and that's where we're playtesting the campaign, as well as all the magic items, as well as the spells. Like everything the players are doing is some form of playtest or another, and that kind of creative, uh, like that kind of free reign to have these players. Do, they love it. That's why it, it's. I've been blessed to have them every two parties show up once a week. Or mm-hmm. two years. Yeah, were were there any ideas that you thought were good on paper, but when you put it through the playtesting ringer, just didn't just didn't work as intended? It, yes, 
several. Um, we, we ended up calling it the Star Girl Staff, I think it was. But uh, one of our uh, magic items was, it was, it was supposed to be a legendary item, but it ended up making uh, an all-powerful wizard that can end up taking on the party by themselves. So uh, we've uh, I, what I do for a lot of my playtesting, no matter what the system, I start heavy and then I start toning it down. Uh, that one was way too heavy and didn't last longer than a half session. But uh, mm -hmm. that that one is one that sticks out, especially in my head. Um, but there's been several where we tone it down right quick, just to to suit in. Um, and a lot of the time, I'll be honest, like uh, some of the players come up with the ideas, and I don't want to say no right away, just like as an improv. So I let them field it, and then I let them decide. What did you feel? And they say, "Oh, that yeah, I was way overpowered." Can't even believe I uh, I even asked you to feel that kind of. So they, my players are very honest. They're not trying to win D and D. Tell me right off the bat if this is going to break the game immediately. And um, uh, I have a few of those guys which are very good at breaking the game. They can um, spot those little combos and class combos that just make it so uh, the game is broken right off the bat. And even in epic fantasy, we're we're level eleven right now. And uh, it's still not broken with what I'm throwing at them, so. Mm hmm And with, with, that, in, with that in mind, um, given, the, given, the th given the three um, given the three books that you have, that you have planned, Vande, Mekum, On the Brink, and Lud Ludio Codex, um, what would you say would be the page count you'd be shooting for for each? I have those, just one sec, okay. So the On the Brink is a bit different. It has uh, some maps that go with it, and those aren't part of the book. But it details the factions, the campaigns, adventures, the side missions, and the legend and explanations of those adventures within those maps. So that one, without the maps, is 48 pages. The Ludio Codex, which is my player supplement, which has all the subclasses, the races, uh, it, it's the one that keeps growing uh, and we're, we're, as we're finished. But uh, at last stand, I'm at like 88, I believe. Yes, 88. And the Dungeon Master, which is already written, it's kind of just going through the final editing stage. Uh, we have that sitting at 112. Mm -hmm. uh, um, those might have to get corrected because there's a rule of four within print. It's not so important on PDF, but in print, there's a rule of four. So, um, but yeah, no, right now we're at 88, 48, and 12. And I get, I gotcha. Well, I will be, I will be certainly looking forward to seeing how it develops. And I do want to give my, th I do want to give my sincere thanks to you for being willing to play, play the game of Time Zone Hell to come up to my temple. <laughs> well, it, yes, I know that we don't exactly match, but. Uh, it's I couldn't miss this. this mm -hmm. is, I like what you're doing with this channel. I've become an instant fan, and uh, just your energy uh, sold me. So I was happy to. I don't normally do these. I definitely have. I'm new to this, but uh, I couldn't miss the opportunity to, yeah. to come on there. So thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often well, say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Cheers to that! I'll put the glass. But uh, I will take you up on that when I learn on my second. We are going to make this a success, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, or I'm reorganizing and uh, coming back at her if need be. But I do plan on making a final push in these, these last two months here. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.